Our next speaker is uh, Adam Jokien, who is a senior lecturer uh, in American Studies at the Swedish Institute for North American Studies at Uppsala University, where I also work, and he is one of my colleagues, actually. He's an historian, uh, and his research focuses on cultural memory, including commemorations, monuments, museum exhibitions, public festivals, and the popular movement of genealogy, which is what we're <laughs> going to hear about here t today. Uh, and. Uh, He's also the co-editor of a book that was referred to here by Erica called Swedish American Borderlands, New Histories of Transatlantic Relations, which is another attempt to, to, to broaden, broaden the grip on this field. Okay, Adam has also been, like Erica and Nils William Olson, fellow at the Swenson Center. So we have two former fellows, uh, or two fellows, not former, two fellows, uh, <laughs> Who, are, who did research at the Swenson Center, who went on to have brilliant careers, and now who can come back and share with us the results of that. And the topic of his talk is, as you can see here, Beyond Family, Swedish American Genealogy, Business, and Cultural Diplomacy in the 20th Century. Go ahead, Ola. Thank you, and thank you so much to, to Dog and to Lisa and to Jill and to Kelsey for, for inviting me and for hosting this, this event. It's always a pleasure to come back to Augustana. The first time I came here was in 2010, I think, but I've been coming here many times since. It's always, always a pleasure. Uh, this symposium is titled The Migration and, and Beyond, right, as Dog mentioned, and the title is pretty spot on in a way to, uh, to what I would like to talk about today. One significant area in the scholarship of Swedish-American relations today concerns memories of the migration or the memory as, as a cultural uh, heritage, and it fundamentally deals with ways in which a history of migration has mattered and functioned in, in society. And there's many different aspects uh, to this for sure, and I will talk uh, about one of them today which is genealogy and, and uh, ideas about Swedish-American uh, ancestry. For those of you who watch TV shows, such as Finding Your Roots on PBS, how many have done that in here? Vast majority, as I suspected. <laughs> you might have noticed that the central narrative in these shows is what, 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 uh, what can be called migration roots, of roots of migration, right? Uh, the tracing of ancest ancestral lineages through migratory paths overseas, often connected either to the European 19th, 20th century European migration to, to the Americas uh, or to the African slave trade. And this is, of course, resonates with the narrative of Alex Haley's um, famous bestseller from 1976 and subsequent miniseries, Roots, the Saga of an American Family. It was a book that had an outstanding uh, influence on African American genealogy, but also ingrained the notion of overseas roots uh, in the minds of white Americans and Europeans. And it's important here to take a step back um, because, and, and consider the fact that genealogy has not always been as popular as it is today. Uh, in 1950, for example, author Willem Moberg wrote a book called Den Okända Slekten. Came out many years later in English as The Unknown Swedes. And he wrote this book while working on the much more well-known, of course, uh, Emigrant uh, Trilogy in the United States. And his argument in this, this book was, um, it was a form of call um, to, um, to people in Sweden that, you know, see you have relatives in the United States that you do not yet know of, right? Uh, and again, the reason for why he called them unknown was because relatively few people at this time, in 1950, late 1940s, did genealogical research. This changed uh, after the 1970s, culturally propelled by Alex Haley's book. Uh, but the growth of genealogical research would not have been possible without proper resources that were in place at that time. Um, luckily enough, by the 1970s, these kind of resources um, had been developed through the excellent technology of microfilm. Right. Today, most of you, some of you who do genealogy here might have used microfilm. I suspect that even more of you have used digital technologies of various kinds, possibly also done a DNA test, which has been popular during the last, last 15 to 20 years. Um, but when thinking about you know, not only why people do genealogy, 
but how people throughout history have done genealogy, it becomes obvious that this is a practice that relies on technology, on resources. And this is not least the case when it comes to transatlantic uh, genealogy, where archival records are located very far away. And I'm sure you know, all of you have gotten used to the great services of institutions like the Swenson Center and the great services of Jill Seaholm, uh, if you do genealogy, right? But if you were a person of Swedish descent in Illinois or in Iowa or anywhere else in the US, uh, in the early 20th century, you wanted to research your Swedish roots. You would have somehow needed to access original copies of vital records uh, located in a state archive or a regional archive uh, somewhere in Sweden or in Europe. So this was obviously a challenge, right? And this is the problem of distance in genealogical research. The combination of historical mass migrations across the Atlantic and the fact that original copies of vital records are stored in archives and institutions in local communities in, in Europe. So to study transatlantic genealogy and how that developed during the 20th century, I argue that we can't only look at this as an individual uh, kind of pursuit. We also need to bring the study of genealogy beyond notions of family so to speak. And one way of doing that is to look at the development of resources, the development of techniques for conducting ge uh, um, genealogy across great geographical distances. Uh, and of course, you know, not everyone can just develop these kind of resources. It requires some kind of institutional influence, which is where aspects of business come into play. And then looping back to, to the show Finding Your Roots, another central aspect of transatlantic genealogy today is, of course, roots tourism. Travels to the homelands of your ancestors. And this practice, too, has a backstory that involves actors of influence and of power. Well, this likewise involves a fair share of business. It is a story about international politics and cultural diplomacy. My talk today will feature two aspects of this, uh, these, these developments, again, focusing on the period before the 1970s, before this became this big popular pursuit. Um, and and I'll, we'll do so by talking about two, um, two cases. First, it's about correspondence or letter writing as a technique of doing genealogical research. research. Now, we'll do so by looking at the case of a woman named Ella Heckscher. I will also talk about the Swedish states and the tourism industry's promotion of U.S. roots tourism to Sweden through the case of the 1966 homecoming year. And these might seem right, like really unrelated examples, but as you will see, they actually intersect. But let's begin with Ella Heckscher. This is a person that I assume that most of you have never heard of. She is somewhat of a forgotten person uh, today, but she was a key individual in the history of genealogy in, in Sweden. She uh, was born in 1882 in a Jewish family, grew up in Stockholm and received a rather good education. Uh, she moved to Uppsala in the 1910s and in uh, 1917 um, started her own genealogical business, the Ella Heckscher Genealogical Bureau. Today I happen to have my office in Uppsala about exactly 100 yards for, from where her, her office and her home was located and also about 300 yards from where uh, her burial place is at Uppsala Gamla Kyrkogård. In the mid-1920s, she began to be, become more well known as a genealogist in, genealogist in Sweden. Not yet because of her business, but because of her parallel work at the Swedish Institute for Racial Biology at Uppsala. She called herself Sweden's first state-employed genealogist. It's probably too, true. I haven't fact-checked it, but I think it, she might be right. She worked there for two years. Uh, for the Institute, the argument for doing genealogy was based on ideas about eugenics as a means of tracking and weeding out unwanted inheritances, including those claimed to be based on race. She was also the first person to write, uh, or one of the first to write, a popular handbook uh, for genealogical research in Sweden. It was published in 1939, but then reprinted in seven editions, uh, the last one appearing after her death in 1970. She also uh, was one of the founders of Genealogiska Föreningen in 1933, the Swedish Genealogical Society that still exists. 
My focus in this story, though, will be on the Ella Heckscher Genealogical Bureau. Because while Heckscher had started her business catering to Swedish clients, she suddenly found herself, after a few years, primarily, primarily doing research for Americans. Most of them came from the state of Utah. In 1924, in the letter to her much more well-known brother, the economist Eli Heckscher, she wrote that she was flying, and this is a quote, flying on the wings of reputation over Utah. She exclaimed that I could never have believed that there lived so many sweets there. <laughs> of course, the reason for this great genealogical interest among sweets in Utah was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so we need to take a little detour uh, through, through Salt Lake City here. Very simplistically put, within Mormonism, family is eternal. Family relations do not only exist in our contemporary world, but will continue into the afterlife. And in 1894, the then uh, church president, Wilford Woodruff, had a revelation. And in that revelation, he saw a call to trace ancestry, but more specifically to trace your ancestry. This has not, had not systemat systematically been done before within the church. And as a direct consequence of this revelation, the church started to launch efforts at supporting and boosting genealogical research among Mormon saints. And as a consequence of this, the Genealogical Society of Utah was created in 1894. The problem, though, again, was distance. Right? Most Mormons had ancestry from Europe, um, mainly from Great Britain, but also a substantial number that had, had roots in, in, in Scandinavia. And there were three options here at, at play. One was to use the on-site resources of, um, in Salt Lake City. Problem was that the library at that point was still rather small, uh, so not really sufficient for this kind of research. The second option was to travel to Europe, but then was of course, was of course complicated and, and expensive. So instead, the third option was to uh, have the research done by genealogical agents for hire. And this became the go-to option of the church from the 1910s well into the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and within this, this kind of scheme, it was correspondence, correspondence research that was, that was key. To write letters became central, not only as a form of communication, but as a genealogical method and a technique in its own right. And a prominent person within the church who worked steadfastly to promote this kind of genealogical research was Susa Young Gates. She was a daughter of Brigham Young, the Mormon apostle and the second president of the church. Uh, and she was very active in, in um, genealogical education at this time. In the 1910s, for example, she wrote a series of genealogical lessons in the society's uh, journal. Um, and the tone of these lessons uh, were, were um, was highly didactical. Young Gates explained, for example, and I quote, that the first requisite of the genealogist is notebooks, record books, pencils, paper, and ink. The notebook should be preferably about seven by 10 inches, as that permits space for dates and names across the, space, the, across the page. The pencil, she continued, must have a rubber, of course, or a separate rubber will be necessary. <laughs> you know, and it goes on like this. <laughs> Of course, to systematically succeed in this kind of correspondence research, you needed to have trustworthy genealogists on the other side of the ocean that could do this research for you. And one such person was uh, Ella Heckscher. In the 1920s, her bureau became the de facto genealogical agent of the Mormon church in Sweden. Her position in this uh, network, the, the LDS Church Network, de developed out of personal contacts and relations. The turning point came in 1928 when her business was covered extensively in, um, in several extremely praising and positive articles in the Utah Genealogical and Historical Magazine, the Society's Journal. Uh, she was, for example, vouched for by prominent fi figures within church leadership. In 1938, as you see here again, she featured prominently in an issue of the magazine, this time with a full page photograph, which was really uh, un an unusual feature of the magazine at this time. Hector traveled to the United States one time during her, her life. In the spring of 1938, she visited New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, San Francisco, and Salt Lake City to give lectures on the methods of doing genealogical research in Sweden. She was greeted like a celebrity on her arrival to Utah. 
Hecksher herself, though, had a, some of the conflicted feelings about Mormons. She felt distant to, to their um, religious seal and had difficulties accepting the notion that she was, as she wrote, sent by God to help them in their genealogical missionary endeavor. But she also admired the way that the Mormons valued ancestry and the great interest that they took in their research. Um, still, she wrote back to her brother that she felt more at ease among the Swedish Americans in the Midwest when she visited um, Minneapolis. And then after her return home from, from this trip, she developed and rewrote the talks that she gave during her tour into that 1939 handbook uh, for, for genealogical research. But how did Ella Heckscher do conduct genealogy then? Well, she did it through correspondence, right? Her office in Uppsala functioned as a clearinghouse with a range of different people and institutions around Sweden. For more recent records, she wrote to parish priests around Sweden to access church books from the last couple of decades. Uh, but the main infrastructure that she used uh, was the regional state archives. These centralized state-run archives were fairly new at the time. The first had been uh, founded in 1899. Uh, and by 1930, there had been seven such archives uh, created around Sweden. The Bureau had research assistants stationed at several of these archives, including the important one in, in Vadstena, as you see here. So Heckscher, what she would do is, sitting in Uppsala, Uppsala is that to exchange letters with instructions and genealogical information, uh, send the, sent that to assistants at these archives. She then complied, um, uh, uh, compiled the results of these inquiries together with information about how the searches had been made and various problems encountered, and sent this back to the clients in the US. And often this kind of research would take uh, many, many years. So it's really kind of correspondence relationships that were going on. Um, she was surely very interested in genealogy, but for her, this was mainly a business, a source of income, and she spent considerable time and money, and no, time and effort, in making sure that her clients uh, paid her fees. So she again, you know, she was very far removed from most of her clients, never met them in person. Uh, this could be a challenging sometimes, and one method that she used frequently was to get um, to get clients to pay her fees was to go through her contacts at the Mormon church leadership and then ask them to put pressure <laughs> on the Mormon states to actually pay the fees which they did very successfully right because for church leaders it was a matter of both pride and reputation that the fees were paid but it was also completely necessary for this whole method and culture of correspondence to uh, to be maintained <coughs> It, re it relied on a great deal of mutual trust. Heckscher died in 1964, but her business remained in operation until 1978, run by one of her former employees, a German Jewish Second World War refugee named Ludolf Hausler. At that point, though, microfilm had taken over the genealogical landscape, which made the Bureau uh, some manual, kind of archi manual archival labor, labor increasingly obsolete. And I mention this because I will get back to this man, Ludolf Hausler, in a little while. But the work that Hester did was the outcome of this kind of specific kind of genealogical activity that grew out of this intense work of the Mormon church. Unlike many genealogists today, though, many of the Mormon clients that Hester corresponded with expressly said that they did not see a need to travel to Sweden to travel to their ancestral homeland. They felt that to be unnecessary. And it might seem like an obvious thing today, right, that so many of us carry this urge to tour the homeland and that that urge is kind of a natural effect of you doing genealogical research. But ancestral feelings have, in fact, also not been steady across time. Roots tourism was not a thing in the early 20th century. It became a big phenomenon in the 1990s, but before that, it was actually something that was supported and boosted by the tourism industry and by state agencies. And that is what I will turn to next in the second portion of my talk. Homecoming year of 1966. This was a tour, Swedish tourist campaign aimed at Swedish Americans. It was an invitation to return home to the ancestral homeland. And this message was echoed in many different ways during the campaign, uh, but one was through a popular song 
by artist, Swedish artist Torres Kogman <laughs> called Homecoming Year. And if this works, it sounded something like this. It makes you want to dance all the way to the boat, right? <laughs> Doesn't it? It's very catchy. Yeah, fantastic song. <laughs> so we're singing Homecoming Year, Welcome Home to Sweden, Homecoming Year for you, right? Um, but before I talk more about what this is all about, uh, we first need to make uh, one more detour uh, to think about a much broader context. Uh, and this is the context of mass tourism. Mass tourism after the Second World War. It might seem like a big detour, again, but, but it's crucial to understand what, what Homecoming Year was all about. Mass tourism really took off after 1945. It was propelled by several factors. One was developments in transportation technologies, where when airplanes made transatlantic journey, uh, journeys significantly faster and eventually also cheaper. Another factor was geopolitics and economics. A uh, big portion of tourists in Europe after 1945 came from the United States. This was partly because the US had come out of the war with its industries and econ economy relatively intact and in a strong position both economically and politically. For many countries in Europe, uh, tourism also appeared as an attractive um, economic opportunity. It was a way for war-torn Europe to create local jobs and to obtain much valued US dollars. And important in this context too, was that tourism was also one of the industries included in the Marshall Plan. Some of the Marshall Plan funding went directly into, for example, building hotels, improving infrastructure, and other means of stimulating tourism. But tourism also had an ideological dimension. European states and tourism organizations responded to the growing US interest in tourism in several ways. One was by creating so-called person-to-person programs, and I'll talk a bit about, more about that in just a second. In relation to these programs, a discourse was created about tourism as unofficial ambassadors. The idea of a tourist as an ambassador was grounded in a specific post-war ideological view of tourism. It was based on a notion that tourism and interpersonal contacts would give rise to common cultural understandings. More concretely, the idea was that tourism had the potential to spread liberal democracy and the benefits of capitalism. Tourism in this sense functioned as a form of cultural diplomacy. And by that I mean the tourism uh, served the interest of the state. That the state actively supported such measures, but that it did so without the state being directly and overtly involved in these, these measures. So this was a kind of a diplomatic work that was carried out by states on both sides of the Atlantic at this time. And these person-to-person -person programs, they were one example of this kind of cultural diplomatic tourism work. The first such program was created in Denmark in 1945 called Meet the Danes. It was organized by the Danish Tourist Association that had grown out of a wartime hospitality program for allied soldiers. Basically, the tourist organization provided a list of people, of ordinary Danes, quote unquote, uh, who were willing to receive foreign visitors in their home, for example, over dinner. So organizers tried to match uh, the professions and interests of the visitor and the host. So teachers would meet teachers, stamp collectors would meet stamp collectors, and so forth. And most tourists that took advantage of this program came from the United States. This type of program became relatively popular in Europe in the 1950s and 60s. In the early 1960s, there were at least 20 such programs in Europe. And in 1956, 
President Eisenhower launched a similar organization in the US called the People to People Program that still exists as the People to People International. And then Sweden had its own program like this, Sweden at Home. It was created in 1954 and was run by the Swedish Tourist Traffic Association. Uh, this was the organization that eventually created Homecoming Year. The Swedish Tourist Traffic Association, STTF, was created in 1902 and it had as its mission to develop international tourism to Sweden. It began to, to receive Swedish state funding in the 1920s and in the 1930s it was officially tasked by the Swedish government co to conduct information activities abroad. A problem though was that this people to people idea seemed a bit taxing for some tourists. Not everyone, after all, wanted to spend their hard-earned vacation in, say, France, uh, having dinner with a French family in Paris, instead of going to the Louvre or seeing uh, the Eiffel Tower, right? And so here, tourism offered an added dimension to this people-to-people -people idea, anchoring so social relations in notions of biological bloodlines. And the first country to develop this form of homecoming tourism on a large scale was Ireland. It was a yearly campaign that ran for several years in the 1950s called Antostal, and sorry for the pronunciation about that. I think it means a gathering or a form of meeting. It was based on an idea from uh, the CEO of Pan American Airlines, uh, and it was a big failure. Uh, the Irish Tourism Association uh, had invested considerable money uh, in the venture, but it didn't really get uh, many visitors. Uh, but still, this Irish campaign became an inspiration for the Swedish campaign, partly as an example of what not to do, actually. Um, and the idea that Roots Tourism could serve as a form of people-to-people -people tourism program was grounded in observations made by several European states at this time, including by Sweden, who in 1951, in a 1951 report, government report, observed that a significant portion of American tourists to Europe appeared to have an ethnic connection to their tourist destination. So this was a resource that the Swedish tourist agency, agencies really wanted to try to tap into. And all of this, right, the Marshall Plan, the economic and ideological considerations, the people-to-people -people idea, these formed the background to the creation of, of Homecoming Year in 1966. The year, was again, was campaign, uh, a campaign organized by the Swedish Tourist uh, Traffic Association, and it came out, was an, uh, based on an idea that came out of their uh, New York office. The idea emphasized the economic aspects that could be great gained from the campaign, but also the more ideological and political aspects. It talked about friendship, the promotion of interest and knowledge about Sweden, and it grounded all of this in a sense of Swedish-American kinship. The campaign was called the Year of 13 Months, since it ex extended over two Christmases, from December 1965 to December 1966. This brochure was printed in 250,000 copies and distributed to travel agencies around the United States. And organizers were really proud that the campaign had received good coverage on US national media, including a mention uh, on the Ed Sullivan Show on, on CBS. They bragged about this internally and externally. Um, and the campaign was focused on connecting American travelers to specific, the specific area uh, from where they had descendants, to invite the travelers to that area and to make the Americans uh, feel at home there, as they said. In the local communities, US travelers would be welcomed as the long lost family. But at the same time, organizers emphasized that travelers also needed to see modern Sweden. In fact, they told the Roots tourists that they had an obligation to see modern Sweden. They, quote, owed it to themselves and to their children to see it. And to support the ancestral Roots dimension of the coming year, organizers made genealogical research a central part of the campaign for travelers that knew that they had Swedish ancestry but didn't know exactly where in Sweden they descended from, or perhaps didn't know any living relatives. Of, um, the the um, traffic association had lined up two genealogists that could help the tourists do this kind of genealogical work. And here comes, as you see, this connection because one of those two genealogists was Ludolf Hausler at the Ella Heckscher Genealogical Bureau. 
um, the then owner of that bureau. And staying true to their uh, original business model, the bureau, uh, the research that they conducted was made, again, through, through correspondence. But while Homecoming Year was envisioned as the celebration of Swedish-American relations based on family ties, there was, of course, also contemporary, uh, contemporary political context that complicated this positive image. These contexts uh, were, of course, the Vietnam War and the Cold War. And it's a telling example here uh, from the newspaper Svenska Dagbladet from the 29th of, of May in 1966. It featured these two stories um, about the first charter group of American tourists that had landed at Arlanda Airport on two airplanes from O'Hare. Uh, but it also featured a story about an anti-Vietnam protest in downtown Stockholm that had become violent. And people also wrote letters to the editors in daily newspapers commenting on the fact that it appeared that Sweden had invited Americans to visit their homeland. And then, you know, when they got to Sweden, they were welcomed by these kind of violent anti-Vietnam, uh, anti-American protests. So these concerns were also shared uh, by uh, representatives from the U.S. Embassy in Stockholm, for example. <coughs> In the end, homecoming year turned out to actually not be very successful either, at least not uh, uh, in the number of American tourists that it attracted. Many regions of Sweden reported that they had barely had any tourists at all from the US during this year. But the organizers steadfastly argued that uh, it had been a great success, because after the fact, they said that it was irrelevant, the number of uh, tourists that they attracted, because it was, quote, difficult to measure. <laughs> Not sure I agree with that. Uh, but what they did instead was to focus on the ways in which homecoming year had been a PR success. What they did, in other words, was to emphasize homecoming year as an idea. Because as an idea, the com campaign had promoted Sweden as a country of both heritage and modernity, but, also but it had also contributed to naturalizing the deep value of Swedish-American relations based on ancestry and notions of shared bloodlines. So to wrap up and conclude, I want to zoom out a bit and focus on two things. First, um, what does this conversation, this study say about the history of Swedish-American genealogy, and, spe most, and spe specifically, and then more broadly, about transatlantic genealogy? I think to begin with, it's clear that genealogical research is, so to speak, not a given. Right. Not at least if you look at it in a historical perspective. It has not always been as popular as it is today. And I think this, coincidentally, is likely the reason for why homecoming year uh, did not attract that many American travelers in the 1960s, because genealogy was not a widespread popular phenomenon at that time. This was partly because paper-based genealogical research, including correspondence research, could not sustain a great number of individual genealogists. Microfilm, digital technologies, on the other hand, made it possible for more people to do genealogy and thus to build a greater um, consciousness of ancestral heritage. Second, and lastly, how does this study challenge our understanding of Swedish-American relations? As so, Dog said before, migration has for long been a central theme within the scholarship of Sweden and the United States, and it will always continue to be central to the field. Most scholarships on Swedish-American relations today, though, does not deal with histories of migration at all, or in, not primarily, at least. But within the sphere of migration, I believe that there is much work yet to be done on the migration as memory, as heritage, and how it has been made useful and functional in the 20th and 21st centuries. And as it happened, this scholarship kind of picks up on uh, a call from the first Ander lecture held at the Swenson Center uh, in 1988 by historian Jod Bodnar, who gave a talk titled The Origin and Function of Memory in Ethnic Communities. This is an inquiry that, ha that engages many themes and dimensions. It certainly deals with identity. It deals with ideas of Swedish-American transatlantic family based on shared ancestry. But it also deals, for example, with business, with religion, with politics. And the two cases that I've been talking about here today sits in this intersection of all of these dimensions, encouraging us to think about the migration not so much as history, but as something yet ongoing in the form of ancestral relations. Thank you.
you very much, Adam, for this talk on genealogy and genealogy beyond. Um, I'm sure there are questions and comments. Who would like to begin? Anyone else? Or Ingrid? Go ahead. Okay, no, thanks. Really interesting. And I, I, just one question, maybe it's beyond the scope of your research, but do you have any idea as to, after 1966, how important genealogy and homecoming dimension has been for Americans who do come for to Sweden for or other purposes? Is there yeah. any, has anyone looked at that? Well, I, I'm trying together with a colleague here at, at Augustana actually to look at that in a contemporary perspective. There's, there's very little studies um, done on that actually. Uh, so there, there was this kind of ethnic roots movement, uh, tourism movement on, going on in the 1990s in certain local communities in Sweden, for example. But there aren't any compiled kind of figures on how many. Uh, Americans that have been traveling to Sweden, for example, for purposes of making ancestral visits. There are no such, you know, data or statistics that's out there still. You can, we can only kind of estimate that um, based on what we do know, for example, about um, roots tourism to, to Ireland, for example, which is much more well studied than a, than a much kind of bigger um, uh, cultural and economic presence in both the US and in Ireland. <coughs> But my, my estimate is that it has been a significant part of uh, American tourism to Sweden, at least since the 1990s onward. Do you have a sense of how common these genealogists for hire were, say, back during Hector's time? I know that one of my grandfathers commissioned a study from somewhere. But it turned out one of our ancestors was a milkmaid who gave birth at the age of two, so he actually never, <laughs> never sent a check on that. But I mean, there must have been an industry in Sweden, not necessarily the transatlantic dimension, where you could have this sort of stuff done by a supposed expert. Do you have any sense of a common that one? Yeah. You know, Hexus Bureau was one of the largest ones in Sweden, it appears, during this, this, this well, first half of the 20th century. But she was certainly not alone, right? There were other kinds of, of often kind of one man, one woman operations. In, there was one in Malmö, I know, for example. And so there were, there were other such businesses. Uh, on top of that, I mean, the Salvation Army, for example, had its, I'm mm -hmm. not sure what it's called in, in, in English accent, the Frelsingsarmens Eftersökningsbyrå. Anyway, the Salvation Army also had kind of a division that, that helped out with, with genealogical research, trying to find sort of lost family members. Uh, you know, the, the um, Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs for many years also actually had, had such a sort of uh, a division uh, that uh, helped mainly in cases of uh, inheritance cases and trying to, to, to also do genealogical research. And, you know, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs also, for example, made use sometimes of the Ella Heckscher Genealogical Bureau. So there was this kind of network of different ma minor and major um, uh, businesses in operation. Um, I'm not sure how many they were, uh, not that many, but, but she was not alone. It was kind of a, a business culture in a sense at that time. Mark. I was just thinking about, you know, you're talking about the, the question of how successful this event or this campaign was, you know, kind of in its, in its year, uh, compared with, you know, what it, what it's kind of doing to shape the iconography of, of like this photo, which is really striking to me because that looks exactly like photos that we have in my family of, you know, going to visit the, the, the farm someplace, and in our case, it's in Vestergötland and it's Brunsdorf, and you know, we've been several generations now taking our photos in front of the, the cabin or the, you know, this, this farmhouse. Um, and just kind of thinking, I, I'm thinking about how this sets up, I mean, it maps onto a timeline. And, you know, in the case of, of you know, my great grandfather, he came to this country in 1903 and returned in 1960-something with this instamatic camera, and, uh, you know, impressed young, um, his young nephew in Sweden that he had this thing with his fancy camera. <laughs> and then we're, we're hearing these stories about this. So I'm mean, just kind of thinking about how this actually is, it's like a not successful campaign, maybe in terms of numbers, but it seems to have actually been quite influential in terms of shaping yeah. expectations about what one does when one when goes back to the homeland. Because it seems like it, it you know, when, when yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's a question about successful and how do you yeah. success. And how do you, yeah. It seemed like it was actually quite successful. 
Yeah, and again, I mean, this is, this is, it's really interesting to read the, 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 the reflective work done by the Swedish Tourist Tra Tourism Traffic Association after this campaign was over, because they kind of stumble over themselves in trying to justify the ways in which it actually was successful. Right? Before, they, would, they said that we, would, we will attract two, 200,000 Americans would come here. And then afterwards, it turned out really not to be that case. So they had to sort of invent a new way of being successful, right? Uh, but it's inter like an interesting comparison is, you know, in, in some, some historical tourism literature on tourism to Ireland, for example, this Antostal, you know, campaign in the 1950s that I showed is actually credited uh, by many stories and historians today as being this really important event for, uh, for projecting this image of Ireland as the ancestral home of Irish Americans, right? Where you could go. Not only this image that we descend from, you know, we descend from Ireland, but we are welcome back there, right? We can actually go there and they want us to come back here. And they have this system in place for us where they will greet us and welcome us, right? Um, and they're, they're, you know, it's, it's these kind of, Discussions about the long-term consequences and effects, they often become circumstantial, right? But I do think you can make a case here that there, there, there was something that was ongoing in this particular moment in time, which is also um, at a cross-section of different generations, right? So there were actually people that were first-generation um, uh, immigrants that had arrived in the 1910s, 1920s, early 1920s or so, to the US that also had a chance to sort of piggyback on this, right, and go back to, to Sweden as a homecoming as well. Um, so I, I do think that, that it, th this was an event that really helped shape this, this image in some form. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Jennifer. I, I was really interested in hearing that Hector's career starts with uh, eugenics. Uh, and do you have any information about her take on that early work? Well, yeah. You know, she <laughs> so, yeah, no, I mean, she, her career had somewhat, I polished the story a little bit. She, it had actually taken, it taken off a couple of years earlier when she had a really big nationally, pu nationally publicized conflict with the uh, regional archivist in Uppsala <laughs> because she wanted to access records that he did not want her to access because she was running a business. Um, so it became this, this, this kind of court case. Uh, that was nationally um, publicized, but but she got this job uh, when when the um, Institute of Racial Biology started, and she never got along. She she didn't like it there. She didn't get along at all with Hermann Lundborg, the director of the of the institute. Uh, but she appeared so in 1924. She published a book together with Hermann Lundborg. Uh, it's called Slecht Boken, or the Family Book, uh, which was basically uh, an instruction for an instruction and a call to the people of Sweden to do genealogical research on both the maternal and paternal lines. And that was something that was not kind of the standard practice at that time, yet, right? You, most people did the follow the family name or the paternal line, right? But she argued, and Hermann Lundberg did too, right, based on ideas of eugenics, that it was extremely important to trace your full ancestry, right? And of course, this, th there's an interesting kind of overlap here that has many significant differences, right? But, but the discussion going on within Mormonism at this time as well, right? It's important to trace both your paternal line and your maternal line. And of course, today, this is kind of something that we have naturalized as well as being, being important of know knowing who you are, right? From the 1970s and onwards, but where genealogy became came connected to, closely connected to, uh, sort of you know, defining your roots, the kind of identity search, uh, you know, uh, who do you think you are, these kind of ideas, right? You need then to find that out. You need to follow both both lines, right? Your your lineage, and she was right in this kind of intersection in the 1920s, 1930s, where that discussion of following all your your total ancestry had, you know. Um, like it had this kind of religious kind of, you know, um, uh, context in the US. It had a eugenics context. And it had a business context as well, because it's really good for business for her, right, that to, to trace more, more lineages. So, so it, there was this, this, this interesting conversation going on at this particular moment in the 1920s about how genealogy could be used within, within um, eugenics. Right. One final comment, Norma Lee. 
Uh, it's one thing, of course, to you, you trace the family lines, and it's one thing to return the connection with Swedish culture. But I'm wondering, was how much in these organized efforts was attention given to how bad it was that forced people to move? Um, and, and, and then the difficult decision to leave there and to come here, uh, like for us, but even more for our daughter, she wants uh, what would be our grandkids, sure, she hopes they'll learn about Swedish culture, but she wants them to know how difficult it was that forced these people to have to go with a tough choice to leave. And so I'm wondering, in, in these promotional efforts, was there an effort to have people come back to Sweden and learn how difficult it was in the 19th century in Sweden? Yeah, absolutely. And you'd think that that would be uh, potentially a pedagogical problem to present, but it was exactly the contrary, right? Because in the 1930s, you know, social democrats had been instrumental in creating the welfare state. It was the notion of Swedish modernity that was on par with or better than American modernity, right, which could be projected. And so there was this, this notion of this clear cut between old Sweden and new Sweden, between the Sweden that the immigrants left and the welfare state, right? And of course, Americans were coming back to the welfare state, right? So this was the, the different kind of Sweden that they met. So old Sweden was there. It was continuously present as the kind of heritage that could be looked back on. Uh, but the, pre the sort of presence of old Sweden in a kind of a narrative and in some sort of myth and heritage, it, it just made modern Sweden appear even more clearly as modern Sweden, right? Uh, so they lived comfortably side by side. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you.